Um, so this recording may be available by request, but that's mainly for on services. Okay. Uh, then, um, so the webinar will be 30 minutes of presentation from Mr. Drew Horton, followed by 30 minutes of presentation from Dr. Misha Kwagninski, followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. So during all the webinar, you can type your question in the Q&A box or the chat box. If you don't see the Q&A box or the chat box, they should be accessible when you click on the three dots on the bottom of your screen. Uh, so make sure you have access to that and type any question you have during all the webinar um, and everything would be answered at the end. And if we don't have time, I think we would have time, but just in case, if we don't have time at the end, don't worry, we will try to answer you uh, by email. Also, uh, one more thing is that at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email with a link for a survey because we are always looking for feedback uh, to improve ourselves for the webinar that we are offering you. Uh, so the survey, uh, please take just two to five minutes to complete the survey at the end. Uh, so on that, as I explained to you, so we we'll start by a presentation from Mr. Drew Horton from the University of Minnesota, followed by a presentation of Dr. Misha Kwagniski from Penn State University, followed by the question and answer. And so I would like first to thank you both for agreeing to participating and presenting in this webinar today. Uh, so I'm going to start by making a short introduction about uh, Drew Houghton. So Drew, I'm going to read, sorry. <laughs> so Drew Houghton has been active in the wine industry for over 20 years, having started as a wine salesman. He then worked at the wine production ladder from Cellar Rat to Cellar Master and eventually winemaker starting in 2004. With a BA in anthropology and early career experience working in kitchens, Drew brings a unique perspective at the intersection of food, culture, and of course, wine. He produced award-winning wines in Santa Barbara County, California, before moving to Minnesota in 2010, where he began working with Cole Hardy hybrid grapes as founding winemaker for Chankaska Creek Winery. In 2015, uh, in 2015, Drew moved from commercial winemaking to research winemaking and providing outreach as a field specialist analogist for the Midwest Grape and Wine Industry Institute at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. As an analogy specialist for the University of Minnesota's Grape Breeding and Analogy Project, Drew produces nearly 100 micro lots of research wine and ciders annually, as well he engages with and provides university and extension resources to winemakers across the country. Drew, can you mute yourself just quickly? Um, this includes troubleshooting planning and evaluating winemaking processes for Minnesota's farm wineries. Drew has broad experience and expertise in winery design and equipment, fermentation techniques, barrel aging, filtration, and blending. Additionally, Drew offers courses and workshops to appeal to the needs of winemakers from amateur to professional. Houghton says, I'm a hands-on winemaker, always looking for the best practical solutions to solve wine and winery needs and issues. So today, Drew is going to present and discuss the tools available for and the timing on how to adjust acidity in the must and wines with a specific focus on interspecific hybrid grapes and wines. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I will stop my video probably as well. And Drew, you can start whenever you want. Do you need to make me a presenter? No, I have share here. Okay. And there's that. 
You should. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. You can put the slideshow. Yep. Okay. All good. Thank you. All good. Okay. Thank you, Ode. Uh, thank you all. I'm glad to be here. Uh, uh, never in my wildest dreams uh, 10 years ago when I left uh, California uh, did I think I'd be uh, here uh, doing what I'm doing now. Uh, but I do love what I'm doing. I'm staying here in Minnesota. I love working with these new grapes. Um, and uh, uh, of course, as you all uh, or most of you are aware, uh, most of these uh, uh, northern climate grapes uh, have uh, have some challenging chemistry. They have low pHs and high total acidity. Um, and I can assure you we're working on uh, that at the grape breeding program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we're trying uh, every day to come up with uh, new grapes uh that have uh, improved cold tolerance improved disease resistance uh, and more moderate acidity uh and uh, itasca is of course the big victory we've had recently uh the very first uh, itasca uh, grape uh, wines are coming out uh, this year um and we just picked uh last week uh, a late harvest a bit of itasca that was still hanging and the bricks was 27.5 uh, with pH of 3.29 and only 5.3 grams of total acidity. So uh, uh, we're getting there, and I can assure you I made a lot of new uh, red wine uh, batches this year. I was just telling Misha and Ode, I've now completed 107 uh, grape uh, wine batches this year um, uh, and haven't even gotten into the ciders. I'm fortunate that we can freeze uh, the cider apple juice until I'm done with the grape harvest. And sometime when things slow down in January, I'll move on to thawing and working with that cider juice. Uh, we're looking at University of Minnesota apples, uh, which are, uh, of course, were bred to be dessert apples, and we're seeing if they are also possibly appropriate uh, for cider production. All right, enough about that. Uh, we'll move on uh, with these uh, practical high acidity winemaking strategies for the Midwest. You don't need to have a, a degree in chemistry uh, to understand winemaking, but you should have a, a basic understanding of pH uh, and total acidity uh, in practical winemaking. Uh, don't be afraid of uh, pH. Uh, hopefully, uh, I can help clarify any confusion or questions uh, you may have about dealing with pH and how to how to interpret your pH uh, readings. Um, of course. Uh, maybe not of course, but uh, pH and total acidity or total titratable acidity, uh, they are related, uh, but uh, it's not a, a, a direct relation. That's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, wines, on, uh, wines and musts uh, on the high end of the scale, uh, let's say uh, 3.65 and higher, tend, usually tend to be lower uh, in acidity. Lower pH usually means higher acidity. Uh, but as I say, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. They're related, but not the same. Um, but we do have to be aware of both of them. Uh, a little uh, refresher or maybe a primer uh, for some of you on pH. Uh, in chemistry class, we learned that pH is the inverse log of hydrogen ions in a solution, uh, which will confuse you right off the bat. Uh, you have to know what an ion is, and you have to know what an inverse log is. But uh, uh, Let's just break that down, make it a little more simple. Uh, pH is a logarithmic scale from zero to 14. Uh, water is uh, neutral, it's in the middle of the scale. It's neither acidic uh, nor basic or alkaline. And it is a logarithmic scale, uh, just like the Richter scale uh, for earthquakes in California. Uh, 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 for example, a, a, a wine or a must with a pH of 3.0 is 10 times more acidic uh, or has 10 times more hydrogen ions than uh, something of a pH of 4.0. Uh, typically, in most winemaking, we're dealing, uh, hopefully dealing with 3.1, uh, the range of 3.1 to 3.65. I'm sure some of you out there have worked with lower pHs and higher pHs. Um, and this is a part of the reason for our talk, is to figure out uh, if we get a wine uh, that is a very, very low pH and high acidity, how can we mollify that? How can we uh, uh, tame that down a bit? Um, 
So uh, and in winemaking, uh, pH is really important regarding microbial stability. Uh, if your pH is too high, if it's over 3.65 or over 3.7, the wine is more prone or more likely to spoilage organisms. Um, so pH is about microbial stability. It's about how the wine feels uh, in your mouth, uh, its structure. Uh, it has some very important uh, 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 properties uh, regarding color retention uh, and uh, ageability as well. Uh, lower pH wines will tend to age longer, whereas higher pH uh, wines uh, won't age quite as long. Uh, TA, or as scientists call it, TTA, total titratable acidity. Uh, we abbreviate it as total acidity in practical winemaking. Uh, it's really an empirical measurement uh, of all the acids uh, in a solution, uh, usually measured in grams per liter uh, or percentage. Uh, you just move the decimal point one way or the other. Uh, the main point is that the higher the total acidity uh, in solution, the more tart uh, or crisp uh, or, or vicious the wine uh, will taste, will feel on your tongue. Uh, the primary acids in wine are tartaric acid and malic acid. Uh, there are also trace amounts of many other acids, citric, lactic, acetic, uh, hopefully not too much acetic, uh, succinic, uh, uh, nicotinic, all these other trace acids. Um, but really we're concerned with tartaric and malic acid in wine. And so people, after I say this to people or give this to the lecture, they say, well, what does that all mean? What is the bottom line? And in my mind, as a winemaker and a wine taster, pH is really about the quality of the acids in solution and how it's going to feel on your tongue. Uh, whereas uh, total acidity uh, is really just about the, the bottom line quantity of acids, if you will. Uh, again, the there's a correlation between them, uh, but to sort of keep them clear in my mind. Uh, I like to look at that uh, sort of thing. pH is about the quality uh, of the of the acids. All the science I've got today, and I hope that wasn't too painful. I am a practical, uh, close to the ground, uh, experienced practical winemaker, and uh, I remind you all, it, it always breaks my heart when a winemaker just picks up the phone and calls the grower and says, "Hey, send me send me that front mac when it's ripe." Uh, I encourage all of you, uh, whenever possible, to get out in the vineyard. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. The best thing for a vineyard are the footprints of the winemaker. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's very important uh, uh, to, especially after verasion, uh, during fruit ripening, that you get out there and physically uh, look and ask questions and touch and taste and smell and use all your senses out in the vineyard. Um, because there's a lot going more going on in the vineyard. Uh, though we're concerned with the numbers, with pH and TA and bricks and all the rest of it, uh, it's uh, not just a doesn't just come down to the numbers. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on that a winemaker needs to know. Uh, so as I say here, for me, winemaking starts in the vineyard. I wouldn't have winemaking without a vineyard, of course. And what's going on in the vineyard? How they're training the vine, pruning the vines, how they're managing the canopy, how long they're letting the fruit hang, all of those uh, viticultural practices can have a major or, or minor, uh, but will have effects on pH and TA. Um, I always encourage an active collaboration uh, between viticulturalists and winemakers. Uh, they really are two wings of the same bird. Um, there are a few of these uh, interspecific hybrids, these northern grapes that have more moderate acidity and more moderate pH. Uh, some of the Swenson varietals like Prairie Star, St. Pepin, Brianna, uh, Edelweiss, uh, uh, those have more moderate acidity and pHs. So I uh, I love to encourage blending. Uh, uh, I'll mention it later, but it's it's not rocket science. If you've got a high acid wine, blend it with a low acid wine. That's one way to, to balance it out. Uh, so I just, I don't focus just solely uh, on the University of Minnesota varieties. Uh, I look at uh, try to try to be aware of all varieties, uh, and not just the Swenson ones, the uh, the French hybrids, Chamberson, uh, those types of grapes as well. Uh, to me, blending is a very powerful tool. We'll get into more of that later. Uh, but uh, to remember, uh, to remind you, uh, remind ourselves of what's going on in the vineyard. Toward uh, we have a concentration on the uh, 
what is that the x or the y that's the x-axis i believe and then time on the y-axis you mathematicians can correct me later what's going on through time of course uh, after duration is the acidities are falling while the sugars are rising uh, and uh, um, we always try to find that perfect point in time uh, when uh, uh, everything comes together the grapes look great they smell and taste great uh, their sugars are high enough, their acids are starting to go down. Um, so decision of when to pick uh, is an essential decision uh, in how to deal how to deal with these high acid grapes. Can't tell you how many times uh, I got a call uh, in August and early September, people asking me, hey, what bricks do I pick my Marquette? What bricks do I pick Frontenac at? And uh, as, I, as I've just said in previous moments, <clears throat> it is more than a number. Uh, you wanna look at uh, you wanna look at the grapes. You wanna look at the vineyard. Uh, you wanna look at uh, the vineyard as a whole. You wanna look at individual clusters. You wanna look at the ripeness, uh, not just of the grapes, but of the skins of the grapes, uh, uh, the ripeness of the stems and the seeds, all of these types of things. Uh, you and the, the grower and viticulturalist, of course, wanna uh, be aware of what's going on uh, in terms of crop load, in terms of your disease and pest pressure on the vineyard. Uh, if you've got a, a ripe crop hanging and the birds are just mercilessly attacking it, you may have to pick it earlier than you would like. So there are other considerations that go into uh, timing when to pick uh, that don't have anything to do with bricks uh, or acidity. And I remind winemakers all the time, as a winemaker, it's not just tasting, it's not just smelling, it's looking, it's touching, it's feeling, it's listening. Uh, use all your senses. That's the glory of winemaking is that you do get to use all of your senses. So with all that being said, let's get down to brass tacks. Uh, what I call the Midwest winemaking high acidity blues or Houston, we have an acidity problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I want to make you all aware is that you have many different techniques and methods uh, to deal with high acidities and low pH. Uh, it's best, I always advise people to use a combination or a variety uh, of methods. Uh, use all the tools in your toolkit, not just uh, one big hammer. Um, we're going to talk about methods of acidity uh, um, manipulation uh, uh, that work quantitatively, that uh, literally reduce the uh, total acidity. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about a few techniques that can help reduce the perception. Um, they may not bring the, uh, the TA reading down, but they make the wine uh, more approachable. Let's easiest one, uh, the one that everybody, the home winemakers start with and you first learn about in, in deacidification is to use uh, uh, what I call under the broad term carbonates whether it's calcium or potassium carbonate or potassium bicarbonate, et cetera. Uh, these are magic powders uh, that will absolutely lower your acidity. Um, but having worked with them both in must and in, in finished wine, uh, I don't like these darn carbonates uh, or I don't like them to use overused or used very much. Uh, overly used or applied too late, they can certainly uh, uh, mute uh, aromas and flavors, they can, uh, uh, out west in California, the old winemakers call it plastering. Well, that wine's got too much acidity, we'll just plaster it uh, with a carbonate. And it can have some deleterious effects on the wine. It can kind of flatten the palate, sometimes even give it a chalky uh, feel uh, on your tongue uh, if it's overused. However, uh, it is a tool, and I know some winemakers very successfully use a small amount uh, of these compounds. Uh, I encourage people to try, if you're going to use, if you're going to consider using these uh, carbonates, uh, use them early. Uh, adjust your must uh, early, get them in there before fermentation. That seems to integrate uh, the effect better. Um, overall, I'm a big believer in trying to adjust your must before adding yeast, whether it's adding carbonates or adding sugar or adding acid, whatever things you can add uh, to adjust your must, try to get that adjusted before you initiate fermentation. Um, in general, uh, one gram, uh, they all slightly different, but in general, one gram of a carbonate will lower your total titratable acidity uh, by about uh, one and a half grams per liter. So that's handy. 
I don't like, I don't advise using more than about a gram per liter. People use as much as four or five grams per liter. And again, I thought the effect on the wine was uh, negative. Uh, and always, no matter what you're doing in winemaking, when you're adding something uh, for the first time or something you haven't used before, uh, bench trials, uh, small scale bench trial manipulations um, help. Um, I get a lot of hard looks sometimes uh, on this technique, uh, what we call a, a, a amelioration or adding water. Uh, I want to assure you that adding water is not cheating and it's not illegal and it's not uh, uh, rare and it's hardly ever done. I can assure you as a former West Coast winemaker and I worked for, for Gallo for three years in a Gallo winery, uh, adding water uh, is uh, a normal course of events. Uh, and uh, I hate to overplay this point, but of course, every gallon of water you add uh, is a is a gallon more wine you've made. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, without question, adding water will lower your total acidity and raise your pH uh, at different amounts. There's different buffering uh, levels in wines, but uh, uh, no matter what, water uh, adding some water will uh, help lower acidity. Uh, if you don't know this, of course, you never want to use any chlorinated water. So the quality of the water is important. Um, I say small additions work without dilution of the flavors or aromas. Um, though I have heard of people adding up to uh, 15 uh, percent uh, by volume of water to a very, very early pick front neck block must. Uh, and they ended up making a balanced wine out of it and apparently it was not thin or diluted. Uh, it still uh, sold very well and was a balanced wine they were able to work with. Uh, in general, uh, amounts two gallons per 100 gallons will reduce your TTA by about 0.1 gram per liter, which is neat. If you've got real high acid and low brick, you add water and sugar. Uh, again, it's not uh, illegal out here in the Midwest. Uh, for anybody who doubts uh, that it's uh, it's legality, I have the, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations citation there on the bottom. Uh, which you can read for yourself. And uh, uh, I don't know many grapes uh, here in the Midwest that uh, are below five grams per liter. Uh, all righty, moving right along. Uh, probably the most important uh, way for you to uh, lower uh, acidity is in your choice of yeast. Uh, there are some really neat uh, yeast strains uh, that uh, metabolize malic acid and, uh, and convert it to ethanol. Uh, which is a really neat trick, uh, as if the yeasts weren't cool enough converting sugar to alcohol, uh, they can convert uh, malic acid to a little bit of ethanol, which is, uh, like I say, I think it's a neat trick. Uh, Y'all got to stop and say a prayer for yeast someday. Without Where would we be without yeast? Uh, I think I just read somewhere that every drop of fermenting wine has something like 2 million yeast cells in it. In my mind. All right. Uh, the uh, yeast known as uh, C uh, by Lalvin uh, can lower your total acidity by about 40 percent, has a pretty decent uh, alcohol tolerance, and uh, a lot of people use it for sparkling wine production. Uh, here's a workhorse uh, Midwest uh, yeast for uh, fruit uh, and red wines. Uh, I use this all the time. I encourage people to use it all the time uh, for grapes like Frontenac. I say it's good for reds and fruit wines. It's nothing wrong with using a 71B in white wines either. Do keep in mind that it has a slightly lower uh, alcohol tolerance, uh, only up to about 14%. So uh, keep that in mind uh, if you're concerned about your uh, fermentations uh, stopping uh, before they're finished. Uh, yeast, not a lot of people know about, SVG from Lalamand uh, also uh, lowers uh, TA uh, considerably. Uh, great for aromatic whites. I know people use it very uh, with good effect for, for the crescents. Has a relatively good alcohol tolerance. A variety of other strains as well besides those three. I haven't used this more than B, which is an Australian yeast, uh, but they claim that it converts up to 50, 56% of malic, which is a lot. Uh, it has a high alcohol tolerance. Uh, like I say, I haven't used it yet. I need to get a sample of it and use it. So far, I've only been able to find it through GW Kent, and they seem to always be sold out of it. Uh, and Vintner Vault in Paso Robles, California has it on their website. 
Uh, and then the other three yeasts, uh, exotics, uh, Opal uh, and GRE. Uh, GRE, by the way, is a wonderful yeast for Grenache. I think that's even where it gets those initials, but uh, it also can lower uh, acidity. Of course, malolactic fermentation uh, will lower acidity. Maybe you don't want to uh, put your crisp aromatic white wines uh, through uh, malolactic fermentation. A uh, quick note about that. 16, I made some lacrescent uh, research wines for the University of Minnesota, uh, and I uh, uh, did some yeast trials, and then I split those up and did some uh, malolactic trials on lacrescent. And I always thought, you know, one of the great things about lacrescent is all of its high, beautiful floral aromatics. And I thought, oh no, uh, ML is going to really mute all those wonderful aromatics. And and it did, but not as much as I had feared. Uh, and another thing, one of those lots I made would not finish uh, malolactic fermentation. It only partially did it. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with partial malolactic fermentation in whites. They do it a lot in, in France with, with the Chardonnay. Uh, they can get it, go through, or they, they, will, they can split the uh, uh, volumes out, put one half through, or a portion through ML, and a portion not through ML, and then blend the two portions back. You sort of get the best of both worlds there. You get some of the creamy, richer texture, but still retain your your, your uh, aromatics, your vibrant flavors. Uh, so you can actually use MLF for some of these uh, 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 aromatic whites, but in general, it's used, of course, for reds. And I just remind people, if you're not comfortable with malolactic fermentation, I always think green apple to milk. Uh, it's a bacterial fermentation that converts the harsh malic acid, symbolized by the green apple, into a softer lactic acid, sort of the, the lactic acid you find in milk or cream or butter. Uh, my first harvest uh, here uh, in Minnesota, I had some Marquette, a couple of batches of Marquette, and uh, despite my uh, all my efforts, I thought the acidity was still too high, and I gave a, friend, a call to my, uh, my predecessor at the university, Katie Cook. Uh, Katie now works for Scott Labs, and she said to me, oh, well, have you put your Marquettes through cold stabilization? And I said, oh, Katie, you don't put red wines through cold stabilization. And she said, Drew, you're not in California anymore. And there's absolutely every reason in the world that you can put uh, red wines through cold stabilization. And just like with white wines, uh, excess tartaric acid uh, can and often will precipitate out uh, as, as crystals, as wine diamonds, as we call them. Uh, so you can cold stabilize your high acid red wines, and uh, that uh, will lower the total acidity. Um, uh, I remind you all, if you're cold stabil stabilizing white wines, you want to, uh, before you stop uh, stabilizing them, you, you should get them tested, get them conductivity tested uh, to ensure that stabilization is complete. The staff at uh, the Midwest Grape and Wine Industry Institute at Iowa State University has a lab, you can send them samples and they can check that for you. Uh, do keep in mind uh, that uh, cold stabilization, um, traditional cold stabilization uh, does uh, uh, take uh, a lot of power. You gotta have a, a cooling system and cool jacketed tanks. Um, so it is a, it can be an expensive proposition, but once again, good old, uh, it is possible. Uh, it's not a silly idea, uh, you can, uh, cold stabilize your wines simply by putting them outside. You got to be careful not to freeze your wines. You may not want to put them out when it's uh, you know 10 or 20 below zero or something, but certainly you can put them out uh, when the temperatures are between freezing and say, I don't know, 10 degrees or so above zero. Uh, and that uh, in general uh, can uh, cold stabilize your wines. I'm sure there's some folks out there who do this all the time. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking at these smaller tanks. It would be hard to use the weather to cold stabilize a 3,000 gallon tank. I agree. Uh, so there you go. As I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite ways uh, to lower acidity is simply by blending. And it's a. Uh, Ode, how am I doing on time? How much longer do I have left? Yeah, I was just saying five minutes remaining. Excellent. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. So uh, it's not a, a rocket surgery. Uh, uh, it's a simple fact that blending low acid wines with high acid wines will lower uh, your acidity. Uh, I'm a big believer in blending. I, I know early or young or newer winemakers tend to be purists and want to make just single varietals 
and that's a fine thing uh, to want to do. Uh, but uh, sometimes the business uh, and the market calls for blends. There's a reason you have a 75% varietal label. Uh, you can put 25% Cabernet in your Marquette, still call it Marquette. Uh, blends do sell. Uh, best selling red wine right now is a Gallo's Apothic Red, and that's a blend. Uh, and sometimes by acknowledging wine blending, uh, it's a great way to help marketing uh, your wine. People are excited about that. They uh, like to imagine the winemaker as sort of a, as a sort of a scientist, uh, a mad scientist, uh, coming up with these. Those are the variety. Those are the uh, ways that you can lower acidity. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of ways here to lower the perception of acidity. Um, uh, just in case you weren't aware. Uh, barrel maturation and extended Sir Lee aging uh, can work to reduce the perception of high acidity. Uh, this uh, autolysis uh, reaction that happens with the fine yeast lees in barrel and in uh, smaller tanks uh, uh, can build not only build complexity in your wine, but can help soften the texture. Uh, and aging wine in barrels encourages malolactic fermentation. Uh, again, these are textural reductions, uh, not uh, quantitative reductions, but uh, Barrel aging, neutral barrel aging is a great way to do that. Uh, and here's a gentleman with uh, glass heads on one of his barrels to show you what it looks like to stir those leaves up. Uh, sweetening is probably the most often used technique uh, for counteracting high acidity. And I know you're probably all aware of that, but while we're on the subject of sweetening, I wanna remind you that there are four ways to sweeten. Uh, of course you can add sugar, but there's three other ways besides that. Uh, stopping fermentation early, uh, either with your yeast choice, a low alcohol tolerant yeast, or with sulfur, addition of sulfur dioxide, uh, cold temperature crashing, sterile filtration. These are ways to stop fermentation early. Uh, in Germany, they use a, a Seuss reserve, a sweet reserve that'll save out some of the uh, uh, original unfermented juice uh, and add it back uh, prior to bottling to give it that natural uh, a balance of uh, glucose and fructose uh, that was in the original uh, must. Uh, and grape concentrate is a wonderful way to back sweeten wines. Uh, you got to check your source. Uh, 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 you want fresh, clean uh, 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 concentrate uh, produced by a, uh, somebody who knows what they're doing uh, and it wants to be kept chilled or even frozen. Um, uh, uh, occasionally, there are stories of a very harmful uh, yeast called Zygosaccharomyces. Uh, that can infect concentrates. So, yes, you can use concentrate, but make sure it's in good condition. So, uh, I encourage you again to use uh, bench trials. Uh, always try to do your manipulations, your additions, your blends on a small scale before applying them to a large scale. I can assure you that very tiny percentages of changes in sweets, uh, sweetening, or in acidity balance, or all these sorts of things can small changes can make huge. Uh, effects in the finished wine. Uh, I always encourage people to do scaled additions and 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 test bench trials, uh, and always keep the control uh, in that group. Um, uh, helps to uh, uh, maintain your sensory objectivity. Choices. Uh, use them all. Uh, don't just use five grams per liter of carbonate uh, when you can make some good choices about yeast and cold stabilization and blending and even watering, uh, watering uh, wine. Um, all right, I know I'm getting close, so I will just acknowledge quickly, yeah. University of Minnesota, where we're driven to discover. Supervisor Matt Clark has a great breeding program, John and Jenny Tool out in the vineyards, and all the other grad students and extension folks as well. And uh, there I was, there I am in Santa Barbara 20 years ago, uh, not even thinking about Minnesota. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Drew. That was a great presentation. Uh, that was great to have an overview of all the different techniques you can use in your winery. So even if you're not planning at using those tools this year, maybe in the future you will uh, need those information. Um, so now that's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Misha Kwajniski. Hopefully I'm pronouncing correctly your last name. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so Dr. Misha Kwagniski is the Assistant Research Professor of Fermented Beverages at Penn State. 
Before taking his position at Penn State earlier this year, he worked at University of Missouri, where low tannin and high pH, high TA wines were among the chronic problems faced by producers. His research focuses, focuses on understanding and remedying problems faced by wineries, distilleries, and breweries through the lens of analytical chemistry. He has also worked extensively to elucidate the relationship between grain conditions and flavors in fermented beverages. So today, Dr. Kwagninski is going to present about or talk about the different pH, as, um, total acidity trouble that we have in the Midwest mostly, and about a new tool or kind of a new tool that is the ion exchange method used to deacidify uh, wines. So, Misha, I'm going to give you the presenter role. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll see how quickly yeah. I can do this and if I actually. That's fine. You have 30 minutes. And <laughs> just a reminder to all the attendees, feel free to ask or type all of your questions either in the chat or the Q&A box. Thank you. All right. Am I up successfully? Yep. All good. All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to talk uh, about a process that really before that moving to the Midwest and being part of when Midwest winemaking and winemaking problems and research, I had no idea was even a reality. And that is sort of the worst situation where you don't just have a high pH or a high TA, um, you have both. And so lots of those great solutions that Drew outlined sort of go out the window. Um, I'm going to very quickly go over <clears throat> a little bit of what Drew already introduced so I can sort of speed through this, but I want <clears throat> a little bit of the chemistry to be on your mind because unfortunately for those of you who are, are maybe not interested in the chemistry, to utilize and really understand what's going on with cation exchange, it really becomes a matter of understanding the pH related chemistry. And so one of the critical points that was brought up earlier is this idea that pH is a log scale. And so that means to change from pH seven to pH six or pH four to pH three, we aren't trying to change one, we're not trying to change from one gram per liter to, you know, two grams per liter or something like that. We're trying to cause a change of 10 times of the hydronium ions. So anything that we need to do is going to be sort of by its nature when you're trying to change pH very extreme and take a lot of change to that wine in a way that um, things like, for instance, carbonate, you would have to use a lot to change um, things around, although that would be more going the other direction. But same thing with trying to add acid. You would need to change a, add a lot of acid to bring a wine from pH 4 down to pH 3. <clears throat> so as was mentioned earlier, pH is critical from a standpoint of biological stability, um, color reactions, color stability, the actual nature of color, as you get higher and higher to the extremes of above pH four, um, some of those anthocyanins can take on a less desirable color. Uh, so there's really some, some benefits to adjusting it just from that. Um, also, for a whole slew of reasons, a, the oxidation rate is higher at a higher pH, and that we also care from a standpoint of protein stability. So generally, as we get the pH at extremes of extremely low, 
um, then it's actually easier to precipitate proteins, um, which is sort of counterintuitive, but that extreme nature makes it more readily that the unstable proteins fall out versus if you're closer to neutral, where they're likely to sort of linger around and only pop out when your consumer decides to open a bottle of your wine. Titratable acidity, or frequently we refer to it as short, shorthand as TA, is important for taste and I think also has a lot of outsized importance in the winery because it's something that's easy to measure. Um, it encompasses a lot of things, but it also isn't re really demonstrating the underlying um, organic acids or cations or everything else that's going in to make this pH acid relationship happen. Um, it tends to correlate quite highly with wine with total acidity, um, but they aren't one and the same. Um, really sort of a seminal work of wine research. Roger Bolton has a beautiful paper where he demonstrates the relationship between total acidity, which total acidity is the sum of tartaric acid and malic acid and acetic acid, and to a lesser extent, succinic and a few others. Um, whereas titratable acidity is either the amount that it takes to titrate your wine with NaOH up to pH 8.1, or you can calculate it if you know the amount of, um, well, I'm sorry, titratable, the titratable plus potassium plus sodium. So total encompasses both the titratable and the cation extent, whereas titratable is just a matter of the actual amount it takes to titrate your wine. So total in a way is very useful, but it's also incredibly hard to measure because you need to actually have expensive specialized equipment like a HPLC to measure it. Just to reiterate this point, that if we looked at sort of a normal wine that could have a titratable acidity of about six grams per liter, um, accounting uh, for what that six grams per liter is also being effective and, and buffered by the potassium content in that wine, it could actually have a total acidity of close to eight grams per liter. And so just from that standpoint, as you're trying to think through, you know, additions and manipulations that even if this was 50-50 tartrate and malate for total acidity, that's a much different number than if you're assuming your six grams per liter is 50-50 and you have three grams of each. So, this problem of high pH, high TA wines, I'd sort of heard of and wasn't, you know, I thought it was a boogeyman that happened on occasion. And then my first year doing research wine at University of Missouri, our Norton came in at a TA of 13 grams per liter and a pH of 4.1, which is terrifying, especially when you're doing you know, small lot experimental vinification to have something over pH four and you pretty much might as well throw it out the, into the drain right as you're beginning the process. So right there and then I knew that we needed to um, start understanding and addressing this. And there, then those, especially in Missouri and Arkansas and Iowa before me that had run into this problem, and had characterized a lot of what mattered. And cultivar certainly is one of the critical things. If you have a variety that wants to have a high TA and high pH, then it's going to most years um, 
no matter what you do about it. Um, also incredibly important is the amount of water uptake. So as you irrigate more, or even if there's water and the vines transpire a lot, um, you're likely to have more potassium uptake. And as you have more potassium uptake, you have higher and higher pHs. And if your fruit also has high organic acid content, uh, which many hybrids have, especially starting out very, very high malate content, you're going to have a problem. There's other factors such as fruit maturity and soil and vine shading. And a lot of work has been done trying to control this in the, the vineyard through either changing rootstocks or adjustments in canopy manipulation. And I would say probably if you sum all of the practices, um, keeping the TA the same, you could probably pull a wine whose pH was four down to three, eight or three, nine. So there's, there's some work that shows that there's significant differences, but not really meaningful from the standpoint of wine stability and safety. So the reason for this high pH is that you know, predominantly calcium, sodium, and potassium um, compete with the hydronium or H plus ions, which that is what causes pH. And so those of you, especially I think that are growers deal with this a lot with the idea of soil ion exchange. And so if you've got more of one, it just tends to be more present in the solution. And so if you've got lots of potassium, then it starts to outcompete the amount of hydronium ions that are out there, and then that drives the pH up. The problem is um, that the solutions for either dealing with the high pH or high potassium um, are sort of in opposition to each other. So if you added tartaric acid, that's a great way to lower the pH. However, it's also a great way to very directly um, add to your TA problem. Um, there's been some work that's demonstrated that you can also use electrodialysis. Um, and if you find that cation exchange is complicated or cumbersome, this is definitely far beyond that. But who knows? You know, I, I think especially as the industry develops, there is probably room for, you know, somebody operating a custom uh, mobile electrodialysis machine to directly strip out cations. Um, cold stability or cold precipitation can help. The more potassium you pull out of that wine, um, the less it is going to be buffered. And as you pull potassium, you're also pulling um, tartaric acid out. So that's great. Um, but again, if you're dealing with extremely high TAs and high pHs, it's probably not going to do what you want it to. Another solution that's been um, used is double salt acidification, um, which is complex and I think in the real world has varied results and is really quite ineffective when you're trying to deal um, with really high malate varieties. Um, so I ended up looking at ion exchange resin as the solution, and it is has actually been approved for wine going back to the 50s. Again, TTB expl explicitly approves it, essentially, as long as you don't drop your pH below 2 or something absurd. Um, and it has the benefit of not only swapping out um, hydro dronium ions for potassium and changing that pH, but at the same time, it's an effective way of cold stabilizing your wine. Um, it's also 
essentially instantaneous in a matter of seconds, you know what the results are going to be. And the resin itself is very low cost. However, as I got into this, there really wasn't any easy, small to medium sized winery way of doing this. There's giant expensive units that can be used and adopted from like water treatment facilities. Um, but when it comes down to it, as you'll see, it really isn't that complicated a process in, in comparison to some of the things that you're already doing in the winery. What does the work is cation exchange resin beads. And so these are little um, round resins that are inert or uh, theoretically inert, and I'll get into that a little bit, um, that have active sites all around the outside. And these active sites have, in the case of cation exchange resin, an affinity for cations, so potassium, calcium, or H plus ions. And if you want to directly change what is in your water, you or water or wine, but these are frequently used in the the for water treatment, you load the resin with something that is preferable. They're even used in um, home water treatment frequently loaded with sodium ions. In larger facilities, they use the hydrogen loaded ions. So on each one of these little active sites, you've got an H plus that will go into solution. And then for each H plus that is lost by the bead, you're going to have an affinity for whatever cation is heavily present in in the case of wine, we're going to predominantly be pulling out potassium. And so it's really a twofer that we're removing buffering capacity, but we're also directly um, influencing that pH by driving it down. Just to look at this a different way and how it actually works flowing through this resin bead, this uh, resin bed, if you've got high potassium rich wine flowing into resin that initially is covered just with H plus ions, some of the H plus are displaced and go out with the treated wine and some of the potassium ions are being sequestered. Um, this, how efficient and complete this reaction sort of depends on how fast you're flowing the wine through. And on the extreme end, I've known some wineries that in fact just put um, a bunch of resin in a sack and stick it in the top of a wine and then pull it out after like an hour, <laughs> knowing that it's done its work. The setup that we work towards designing was really trying to make it so winemakers had a lot of control so that it wasn't just a matter of, well, let's dump this in and see what happens, but that if you've passed the wine through a exchange bed and it can be um, anything from custom built units that can be used for water, two things that I'm going to show you how you can build your own that can do up to really easily a thousand gallons or more per pass is that you're mainly using equipment you already have in the winery. And so you pump from one tank using a standard, you know, uh, wine pump, pump through a resin bed and then pull, pump into a holding tank. You don't necessarily have to pump or treat all of your wine to get the effect that you need if you are able to drop a portion of your wine to a good blending element you then can you know be able to use that um well to be used that for blending so some real world numbers of what we ended up finding as we were doing trials on sort of lab and small winery scale that a wine in this case it was a uh, chamberson that went in with a ph41 um relatively low ta in this case but you know 
Um, wine research doesn't always hold for exactly what you need, but on it went through the resin bed. The potassium ions dropped by nearly half from 2200 milligrams per liter down to about 1300 milligrams per liter. And we were able to drop that pH all the way from 4.1 to 3.5. To look at this a different way, um, not all of, well, so as you're pumping, not all of the reaction happens instantly. And also there's some different preference as far as different resins between potassium, calcium, and magnesium, as well as you're shifting a bunch of the equilibrium. And so immediately with this wine, after introducing it, you have a shift from, in this case, a wine that was 3.9 down to an incredibly high or incredibly low pH of 2.5 and then that starts to creep up as all of the resin active sites are utilized until we get this final um, value where basically the pH of the wine is the same as what we started. However, we've shifted the cation content quite a bit. What we put together is basically we use a spool of um, sanitary tubing that you can buy in any number of diameters. Now, especially with the um, small distilling uh, being quite in vogue, there's just lots and lots of options as far as diameter. But this setup, we were using. Um, three inch spool and the sight glass was really just there to show what the resin ends up looking like in that tube with a gasket with a screen. Now, unlike, um, you know, trying to push through a filter bed or something, we're not trying to pack the spool so that there's a lot of back pressure. We're actually trying to design the system in a way that the wine flows really, really easily in. So we generally only fill the spool up about two thirds um, and then slowly pump the wine through with all of the resin being trapped. Now, again, there's as many different ways of attacking this as there is really winer, winemakers and ways that they can think through utilizing their equipment. I've known some wineries that have done this effectively by dumping the dire resin directly into a tank and then pumping out through a mesh gasket or some sort of filter. The one warning I would have of doing something like that is the little resin beads are really, really annoying and get everywhere. So you, as best you can, want to control um, how you make it that they they don't end up everywhere and in um, your trench drains and that you're seeing these little shiny flecks for the rest of your winery's life. Um, back when I was in Missouri, Le Bourgeois was nice enough to host a demonstration and we did a couple of 200 gallon per run batches. Now that 200 gallons, Again, you could scale it up to do more per run, but it was actually enough that they could then blend in another 300 gallons to have a fully full 500 gallons of wine that was going into barrel at the pH that they wanted. And so acting, thinking of this as another tool in your toolkit to create wine for blending to get it where you want is an option, not necessarily that you're going to all of a sudden have to treat every wine um, fully to drop that pH. Let's see if we can get this to work. So just to give you an idea what this sort of looks like, you know, you can see that this really is not a fast pumping system. We're just slowly 
and easily trying to pump from the bottom up through the resin bed, allowing the wine to fully interact. And then as it comes out, you've changed the pH and changed the cation content. The main steps to effectively doing this is first, you need to rehydrate the resin. So it comes somewhat dry and probably only about um, uh, 50% to 75% of the final volume. And so if the first thing you do is pack dry resin into something, it'll keep expanding on you to the point that um, it will really close down the system. So first rehydrate it for a couple of hours. I recommend using, uh, you know, like a 100 ppm SO2 solution just to make sure that you're keeping everything nice and sanitary throughout the steps. Um, then rinse the beads, rinse the entire system. So run the system through with water just to remove any particulate or any um, extra sanitizer might be there. Slowly pump the wine through the resin bed. You shouldn't have really much back pressure at all. Um, a variable pump is ideal, but you can also construct a bypass so you can keep that um, pumping slow and steady. And then just monitor the pH, pH as it comes out. And once you reach the starting pH, you're done. You've reacted all of that resin. Um, you can re rinse the resin and actually reuse that resin over and over and over again, really as much as you can keep it nice and clean and sanitized. So if you think of it as like a really, you know, your nice um, final absolute filter that you can probably get several runs or if you're a small winery you may be even getting several seasons through the same thing with the resin that initial investment you can recharge with a strong acid um, which i've outlined the calculations on a sheet that i'll make available to anyone who's interested and keep using that resin over and over again and then store in an so2 citric solution for the next time you want to use it for about 500 gallons to treat, it's going to be about $150 worth of resin. But as I said, you can do that over and over again. So if you get two batches out of it, you're now down to $75. If you get three batches, 50 and so on and so forth. So it really can be a very cost-effective um, way to adjust both your TA and pH and you can get about 50 bed volumes or for a given cubic foot or liter you would so for every liter of resin you would get about 50 liters that you would treat um, completely from that wine in practice um, i think the most important thing that was said earlier is start with benchtop trials this is immediate um, so you put in different amounts, you see what the effect is, not only on the pH and TA, but also any other effect that may be happening with your wine. And if you don't like what it's doing to your wine, don't use it. It's just not the option that's going to work for you. Um, so as you're changing, um, the pH also remember that you're changing the amount of SO2 that you're going to need. So the dosages should be adjusted. And there are some questions that I'm very briefly going to get uh, go over related to what it may do to wine flavor and um, other characteristics. One of which um, was sort of the last steps of one of my graduate students that was quite surprising. We found with very high additions, we actually got um, a reduction of alcohol, which is sort of a nice side um, use for this. Under normal conditions that I would say that you would be using for adjustment of pH, you're always going to be under this about five grams per liter, five grams of resin added, um, which is sort of a meaningless unit right now 
but so you might see 0 0.1, 0 0.2 um, reduction of ethanol. However, it is potentially an option to, with no energy, actually sequester um, ethanol and reduce that after the fact. Likewise, there's some shifts um, that happen with some of the organic acids and some flavor compounds, all of which we're now identifying is due to uh, equilibrium, not with the actual active sites, but the, the resin itself, that sort of acts as a semi-permeable membrane. And so if it was hydrated with water or you ran through a water or a wine that was very low alcohol before it and then did a high alcohol wine, more of that alcohol or organic acid or flavor compound is going to be sequestered by the resin. Um, in some cases, this can be a good thing. It can pull out a little bit of things like volatile acidity. Um, but by and large, I would say these are sort of secondary impacts that if you like the impact that it had on your bench trial, then you're going to be happy with it as an option for your winemaking. And then just lastly, we, we did some work with sensory and there was at no point in the descriptive analysis that the cation exchange ever enhance any um, negative attribute. In fact, uh, it tended to reduce some sulfur aromas on some of the wines. Um, and in some cases, there was instances where it actually increased things like fig and cherry and Norton. But for the most part, it really didn't have a lot of impact that could be picked up from a sensory standpoint. So with that, thank you for listening. Also, I have to thank the Missouri Wine and Grape Board, as well as the Missouri Marketing Wine Research and Marketing Council that helped fund this while I was there. Um, Brian Wayne, um, Megan Wesolensky, and um, Joe Beretta are all grad students that have worked on this project over the years as it went from something that was sort of a, a quick and easy idea and got more and more complicated. And sort of the take homes are it's effective. Um, it can have some results on quality, some of which is actually positive. And there's a pretty modest cost associated with it. So with that, I will stop. So we still have some time for, for questions. Thank you very much, Misha, right on time. <laughs> Excellent. OK, so thank you for your great presentation. That was maybe a little bit too much science for some <laughs> of the, the attendees, but that was very interesting. That's always good to see the different options uh, people can have. Uh, so on that, we will start the question and answers. So we will start probably with question for Drew. Um, so the first, but Misha, if you want to help uh, answering, or if you have opinion, feel free to, to answer okay. as well. Okay. Um, so you mentioned, so Drew, you mentioned that lower pH wines age longer and higher pH wines are more susceptible to spoiling. Is there an ideal pH? Oh boy. Uh, no, uh, winemaking is not uh, recipe driven. Uh, a brewer has a recipe and a brewer can create the exact same beer with the exact same uh, chemistry and flavor profile every day of the year. In winemaking, we get a different crop every year and every year is different. And the same grape grown in the same vineyard is going to have different bricks, pH and TA every year, depending on... So I, the short answer is no, I, I don't really have an ideal pH in general. Uh, white wines tend to be on the lower part of the scale, let's say 3.1 to 3.5. And reds tend to be on the higher part of the scale, let's say 3.35 to 3.7 or something like that. Uh, these are generalities, um, um, but every wine is different, just like every year is different. Especially I'll, I'll as everyone in. mentioned, like the pH would be very different if you're talking about a vinifer wine 
or if you're talking about a hybrid wines. So I think there is no good read answer. I'll, I'll go a little bit out yeah. on a limb and say that while there may not be any good answer, there's bad pHs from a winemaker's perspective. <laughs> and if you get above 3839, you're going to be scared. So that you want to keep it below that. And you get below pH 3 and I've had some beautiful, you know, dry Rieslings that can handle that, but you're sort of in a danger zone. And so you want to make sure that you're on point with all your winemaking. Yep. I, I would certainly agree with you. Absolutely. And this yep. point as well is that general vinifera uh, uh, tend to be higher in pH and lower in acidity, and these interspecific hybrids tend to be uh, higher in acid and lower in pH. Thank God I've never had to deal with a Norton that came in at 4.0 uh, <laughs> with what was that 12 or 13 grams of acid i, I think i would kill myself uh, but not anymore and now i have an answer i would call you up immediately Misha, and say where the heck do i buy some resin beads well as a researcher it was actually oh wonderful i've got something to do here <laughs> <laughs> exactly for sure yeah. was there another i had a question on the chat oh did you see that yeah yeah so I, uh regarding blending yes to, yeah okay um um i'm a little confused by the question uh, let me just say uh, when i was talking about blending a low acid uh, 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 wine with a high acid wine and i use the example of cabernet and marquette um and again, these are generalities. In general, when you order, uh, and I'm talking about ordering grapes from the West Coast and making the wine here in Minnesota and making the Marquette here in Minnesota or wherever you are, I'm talking about blending finished wines. And I think it's inescapable uh, uh, that uh, almost any Cabernet uh, is going to come in with a relatively lower acidity, let's say, you know, maybe only four and a half or five or six grams per liter at the very top. Uh, and it's gonna have a relatively high pH, let's say above, you know, three, five. And in general, uh, Marquette's won't have that high pH and uh, sorry, that uh, that high of a pH or that low of an acidity. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so adding one to the other will lower the overall acidity. Um, yes, there are exceptions, uh, 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 and I've also, just this year, or the last two years, run into a couple of events with Marquette, where the Marquette was picked and crushed, and the initial uh, pH came in at, say, 3.3, uh, which is rather normal, um, and then at the end of fermentation, that pH had jumped up to 3.9 or 4.0, uh, which was surprising. And I'm, uh, again, this is something that I think Misha would, could probably speak to uh, in terms of uh, uh, some viticultural practice, uh, excess uh, calcium or potassium or something. But anyway, um, no, uh, to answer this question and stop beating around the bush, in general, I'm talking about uh, you can take almost any red vinifera uh, finished wine and blend it with almost any red uh, uh, hybrid, uh, and you will make a more balanced wine. The Cabernet and Marquette uh, issue, of course, one of the other things is that uh, Marquette is, tends to be lower in tannin and Cabernet tends to be higher in tannin. And when I've done blending of wine uh, uh, after fermentation, uh, uh, right before I was gonna do cold stabilization, uh, I enjoyed the effect. It made a more balanced wine. Uh, those tannins were retained uh, better. Um, uh, and those can ones, I, go ahead. Can I ask you a the same question? Like, but if you don't have any Vitis vinifera to do the blending, what would you suggest? Or is there a specific um, wine that you can blend both coming from hybrid? Like, if you want to lower uh, the acidity of a front neck, yeah. What would you recommend? Like, do you have a hybrid variety that? 
you will prefer to use to blend and reduce the acidity? Or? Well, I used the example earlier where I made a lacrescent based blend uh, and the lacrescent was low in pH and high in acidity. Mm -hmm. I blended it with uh, some of the Swenson varietals with St. Pepin, with a little Brianna, uh, with some Prairie Star. And all of those three had more moderate pH, more moderate acidity. Um, and it ended, and I blended it, that wine ended up being about 55 or 60 percent of a crescent and 40, 45 percent a blend of these other Swenson varietals. And it it took the edge off. It balanced it out and it, and it made it really added to the complexity. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about blending is you, you uh, in blending, one and one doesn't always equal two. One and one can equal infinity sometime in blending. Uh, you can't put your finger on why you like the blend uh, yeah. parts. Um, uh, it's it doesn't getting, always happen. A plug for the the program that you're involved in. I think that exactly demonstrates why breeding is necess necessary. That a lot of the characteristics that go hand in hand with what we want for things that can handle the cold and have disease tolerance also are coming from varieties that are incredibly high acid. And so to decouple those is really a Herculean feat of great breeders that's going to take a bit. But I think the indications are that it's there, that what there might be in five or 10 or 20 years, it's going to be a whole different um, game for Midwest winemaking. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And, and, and I must say, uh, in all humility, uh, we're not the only institution working on uh, this uh, this problem. Uh, there are a variety of private breeders out there who are tackling this. Of course, Cornell University has done a lot of research. That it doesn't get quite as cold there as it does here in Minnesota, uh, but they are also working on this problem. And uh, 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 Washington State uh, University as well. Uh, uh, so. There are folks working on it, and as you say, we're getting, we're learning more and more genetics, the field of genetics, and 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 what's called marker-assisted breeding, uh, is expanding all the time. For example, we've uh, some work a graduate student uh, did at the University of Minnesota. His name was Sun Lee Tay. Uh, he's now at Washington State University. Uh, he was able to locate uh, four uh, uh, spots or loci. Uh, on the grape uh, uh, genotype uh, that uh, signified a resistance to powdery mildew. And we have already been able to adapt that uh, technique and look at our thousands and thousands of new grape seedlings every year uh, uh, by taking a, a, a tissue sample of leaf uh, and looking at its genome and saying, ah, uh, these 9,900 uh, do not have that uh, mildew uh, 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 resistant gene, uh, but these hundred do. And so we'll throw those others on the uh, compost pile and just work with these hundred. So we, uh, it may not speed up the process from start to finish to get a new grape, but certainly it creates an earlier bottleneck uh, that allows us to make better decisions earlier on what, what uh, new seedlings we should keep working with. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question regarding the Katyan exchange. So your presentation, Misha, can you talk about the Katyan exchange and its stabilization effects? Um, in relationship to like potassium or, or just in general? So maybe just in general. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that's a very nice um, side effect is you are actively removing cations. And so from a tartrate stabilization standpoint, it, it's effective and it actually is about the only solution solution for um, calcium tartrate instability, which um, rears its head every so often. I three years ago had a winery in Missouri that came to me with this weird problem. And as we got further and further into it, it was like, oh, I, I read about this as a thing, but never actually seen it. Um, it also through lowering the pH, you're going to have a much more microbially stable wine. And so, you know, even in, in, this is 
true whether you're making the wine that you want or not, but a wine that's at pH 2.9 is always going to be more stable than one that's at 3.5. That it's just, it, it essentially is in stasis and you as a winemaker can sleep better. People may not want to drink the wine, but you know that wine's going to stay with <laughs> what it was. Um, so it's a really, I think, important tool from that standpoint that if you know that you know you've had problems with bread in the past or SO2 management is something that doesn't always isn't your friend, bringing that pH down puts you in a space that you're a little bit safer um, throughout. I've actually sort of wondered, um, you know, it, the effectiveness for people that are looking into distilling brandies where you can't really use SO2, that if you can drop that pH way, way down, you've got something that's very stable until you finally get to the point where you can distill your product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, so just, just a quick follow up. Yeah. Um, when is the proper time to do ion exchange? The, uh, I assume you don't want to do an ion exchange on wine A and then on wine B and then and then blend them. Is this something that happens before blending and before cold stabilization, or is this something you could do the day before bottling? Yeah, I had the mm -hmm. same question. <laughs> so definitely you want to figure, do it before final cold stabilization, because it's going to throw everything out the window, probably make it more stable. And you, it's not worth going through all that cost and effort to find out that you in fact didn't need to even cold stabilize anymore. I would say it, can definitely be done before blending. What we were not effective to do, and to a point in um, through your presentation, I, I completely agree that any intervention you can do before fermentation is ideal. And we tried that and made a horrible mess. <laughs> we're not able to figure out any way, including pressing off a red to have its juice by the side and try and treat it and reintegrate. It just, I, it may be possible with, you know, a, a team of engineers helping you out, but as far as coming up with a cheap, easy way to do it with existing equipment, that wasn't happening. So basically, once it becomes wine and any time before you're about to stabilize is an all right time to do that. And mostly what I have seen wineries using it for is before it goes into the barrel. So then you've got something much safer that's sitting in that barrel aging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have a question related to where would we find the raisin bean beads? Um, your local Culligan man um, online, they're actually very readily available. What you just need to check as you're talking, especially if you talk to a salesperson, they are first going to want to sell you the sodium loaded beads because that's what most um, homeowners use. Uh, but they all have the hydrogen loaded beads available. It's actually quite widely available. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have more questions, but if we didn't answer any of the question or just if you have a question, you still have like six minutes to type it. Um, that's more a comment that we have in the chat box. Oh, we have two comments. So the Swenson cultivars have common pedigree in different combination. And when you blend as Drew suggested, it's like a family that sings together compatible tones, but <laughs> slight difference bring a fuller sound. And then quite often Midwestern wineries are shooting for a particular pH related to ripeness. Does this allow a grower to harvest earlier and avoid some of the bad characteristics when fruit ripens further? That's a question. Misha's technique. So the problem I, I suppose uh, is that you, the cation exchange wouldn't help you with removing malate. And so it, it, 
it could be a tool. So if you thought in a multi-step process that you neutralize some of the malate or you were going to go through ML on an early grape variety so that you hadn't really gotten that full descending on the curve, um, that then you could still adjust, have a unacceptable pH, run it through cation exchange, and then bring everything back into focus. I have not played around with that, but I think theoretically as part of a multi-step you know, winemaking um, sort of package, it probably could work. Okay. Uh, so we just have another Q question in the Q and A, but I think that's similar to uh, where we can find the resin beads. Uh, where can we get the paper on recharging, caring for the beads? So that's related. Um, I can share it. Uh, probably easiest. Um, this is sort of still in the the beta phase, so I, I definitely am looking for any feedback for anyone who starts working on it, and have my email front and center on the sheet. But it takes you through all the steps, including recharging. And I call it a brief, but it's probably, I think, about four pages of fairly dense instructions. Um, but I could make it available to um, either individuals, or is it easier that I could have it that you could post it somewhere? What seems easiest? Uh, you can, so if you are looking, so the attendees who are looking for information, they can reach out to us and then we will spread the information to you, Misha or Drew. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's it for now. I think we don't have more questions. Uh, just to finish on, so first I would like to thank you both for your great presentation. Um, then I want to uh, explain you that we will have another research and winemaking webinar next week at the same time, so 3 p.m. Um, Central Time. That would be on malolactic fermentation, so stay tuned to have a follow-up on the acidity using malolactic fermentation. Uh, then we will have another webinar on November 10, same time, on filtration followed by an, in November 24 on barrel maturation, and then December 8 on bottling and closures. So stay tuned for those uh, next webinars. If you have any question, feel free to contact us for any question. So at uh, whatfollow at iostate.edu uh, or to dhorton at umn.edu. And remember to take like few minutes to complete the survey you're supposed to receive by email uh, regarding how we did today and what we can improve. Um, I think I saw a comment or a question chat uh, requesting the beads presentation. Okay. And will the webinar be available to view again later? If you need to have access to the recording, feel free to send me an email and I will create um, a file, like a link to have access to the presentation. Uh, on that, I think we're good. Um, what else to say? Thank you, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Bye, all. Bye. Everyone. Bye.